before we start, let me introduce myself. Uh, so I'm Kirjain and I will be uh, your host for today's Talkie Talks. Um, and before we start, let me just um, go through some of the agenda and just explain what will happen uh, for today's session. So firstly, um, I will go through some of the guidelines, um, which is, you know, some guidelines that we all have to follow uh, during throughout the session. Um, and then we will have some time to get to know our Taoke today a little bit better. Uh, and then we will go into a sharing session, which is where our Taoke will be sharing um, her entrepreneurship journey with us. Um, and then we will have a QA and a session which is when you, we will address any questions that uh, you have asked in the chat box or any questions that you have submitted during registration. Um, and then lastly, we will close uh, by announcing the next Talkie that you can look forward to and also where you can find out more about uh, our Talkie's business and also uh, RISE programs, right? So just uh, to remind everyone of the guidelines for today, um, so please stay muted and turn off your video while you're in this uh, Zoom meeting, um, because this Zoom meeting will be recorded. Um, and if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat. Our team will compile them and I will be asking uh, our Taoke during the Q&A session. Lastly, please use respectful language in the chat for everything will be recorded. All right. So again, welcome to Taoke Talks. Uh, Taoke Talks is a series of sharing sessions where small but mighty businesses uh, come and share about their motivation to start their own business and the story behind their journey. And this sharing session is brought to you by RISE, a Malaysian research and social outreach project that empowers Malaysian youth through entrepreneurship. And RISE is proudly supported by City Foundation. And we at RISE believe that entrepreneurship is not just for the big startups that uses really advanced technology, but also for small local businesses. Um, and RISE really aims to showcase these stories of local businesses um, here at Tauke Talks that are still persevering uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so without further ado, I'm really happy and excited to welcome our Tauke for the night, um, Mars from Sangun & Co. Hi, Mars. <laughs> Hi. So um, yes, uh, I'm Mars from Sangon and Co, and I'm one of the co-founders of Yep Sangon and Co. Um, it's actually a two-people business. So I think Annie is here tonight. Yes, that's Annie. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Basically, um, uh, yes, Annie says hi in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, um, what we do is uh, we make handmade jewelry based on, um, well, we try our best to um, name them after uh, local folklores and like tales that you read um, from primary school up to like high school. And so some of you may be familiar with it or some may not, but um, that's basically why we started Sangon and Co in the first place, because we just wanted to like share more of our Malaysian culture to everyone. Because it never gets boring anyway. So <laughs> even if you're Malaysian, like, you know, why not? So, yeah. All right. Um, and we do have uh, some photos of your products here. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Sure. Um, so basically, we cater to both guys and girls so it doesn't matter um what you identify yourself as but um it's available to everyone and anyone and um basically we use freshwater pearls most of the time but um from time to time we try and switch it up to um raw materials natural materials like um uh semi-precious stones basically gemstones and uh shells and uh yeah that that's kind of about it and also um 18k like gold plated materials but currently every business grows so we're currently trying to um grow into more gold field and higher quality materials yeah <laughs> thanks for thanks for sharing um and if someone is interested in checking out your products where can they find you um, you guys can find us on Facebook or Instagram, but we highly suggest Instagram because you can see our entire feed. It's all <laughs> proper and we try our best to be aesthetically pleasing for your needs, <laughs> for your eye needs. And um, we also have a website. So the link is right on there. You can just click it and you can view by collection, category or yeah, whatever you like. So um yeah, and also if you want to have any custom pieces done, you can always 
feel free to DM us on Instagram or Facebook. We'll respond to either. And yeah, we'll try and get your ideas uh, to life. Nice. Okay, so everyone, if you're interested to check out Sanglin and Co, you can head on to their social media after this. Um, so now we know a little bit uh, about Sanglin and Co. Um, let us talk about you and your entrepreneurship journey, Mars. So what inspired you to start this business? What inspired me was uh, it's kind of a long and short story at the same time. Um, but um, when I started Sangon and Co, I when I wanted to start Sangon and Co, I was actually in the midst of finishing my last semester in uh, diploma of graphic design, and so already kind of being in the artsy fartsy background, I just kind of wanted a platform to share more of what I could do and or what I can't do. So basically, I had zero skills in jewelry. Uh, I actually, Annie and I were never friends. Sorry, Annie, but like we, we were just never friends. Okay. We were never friends, but uh, we were mutual friends. I, I was friends with her cousins first. Uh, we actually met through church. So um, after that, like after all these thoughts of, you know, I want to start this, but I don't know how, but they're really pretty, but I don't know how. And so one day I just got bored and I went on Twitter and I tweeted, um, does anyone here know how to make jewelry? And so like day one, no response. Day two, still no response. Like third day, Annie just popped up and like replied like, I can do jewelry. <laughs> and I was like, okay, on, let's start. And so on the day we met, we were actually supposed to just um, catch up, like, you know, uh, buddy buddies do, just talk about life. But then we ended up being extra excited and then we just bought our first few materials with our own money which wasn't a lot to be honest <laughs> so from there we just started an instagram account and then we started the the next day so i would say sangon and co started out of an accident and we had i can tell you like countless of talks um, between annie and i that we wanted to keep it strictly hobby only because i we were both still students and trying to like figure out life as students and we couldn't have that commitment to start a legitimate like business but then as time went by we just couldn't stop <laughs> and then um when we reached like 300 followers that was when we realized okay this is getting real it's too late to stop now <laughs> so yeah that's how we started but also our inspiration came from the pandemic. So the reason why Annie was back in Kuching because um, she studies in Singapore was actually due to the pandemic. And so we were thinking of ways on uh, how do we start a business, but it could also relate to other people. And so with the pandemic, obviously you can't travel and we want to give options to people where they could know about our culture without leaving their homes and so yeah being a travel agency well that's impossible because we can't we can't fly we can't you know yeah and so one other thing that what would catch especially girls like I would say I'm not gonna lie we spend a lot of money <laughs> and so what to get their attention would be jewelry and so it, it just fit like everything just um it just suited each other like we like jewelry and he makes jewelry and during the pandemic, we can't fly, we can't travel. And so why not, through handmade jewelry, we inspire others to learn more about us. Yeah. Wow. So interesting that like, it all kind of sort of started with a tweet almost. It's very soon, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what happened? You found Annie, right? Who actually knows how to make jewelry. Wow. I know. So <laughs> I always tell her, like, Annie, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't know what I would do. <laughs> Right. So, um, so did you, so you started your business during the pandemic, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, specifically a week before lockdown in Kuching. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> when we sold our first item, we literally only had like six days of like physical operation where it was like self pickups and all that. 
Right. Um, okay. So um, I'm sure, you know, starting a business obviously is not like an everyday thing. <laughs> it's definitely very difficult. So uh, can you share a little bit uh, about what were some of the challenges when you first started and how did you and Annie overcome them? Uh, challenges. I, I can't say that the challenge was um, the pandemic because, I mean, we knew the pandemic was coming and we started anyway. But uh, I would say ours personally was to be real to our audience. I would say um, when people start a business, usually most of the time, they would want it to be very, like, um, very studio feature, very, like, in a way, quite Atas, I, I don't really know how to put it, but basically there's a look that people would expect like businesses to be. And also, um, I would say before the pandemic, owning a small business, uh, it was very hard to get around to proudly say that you're a business owner. And when people ask you like, oh, what business, like what company do you have? And you tell them like, oh, uh, no, I just, uh, I work from home. I do this. I do handmade jewelry. It doesn't really sound nice, you know? Yeah. And so um, I would say that was one of the challenge. I would also say my family and friends had to re- like adjust to what I was actually doing with my life and convincing them that like, this is what I'm doing. And yeah. And so Annie as well, like um, as a student. Uh, so I think that was what both of us could relate to. Yeah. But other than that, um, yes, trying to stay real to our audience that not everything has to be like super pretty it can also be very raw and organic as a human being and so that's why we want to work with natural materials available to us especially being on the island of Borneo it's everywhere it's it's always available to us anyway and so yeah we use that to our advantage nice thank thank you so much (laughs) um so just out of curiosity so do you or any um, have any business background or what, what was, um, so how, how did you cope with that, you know, now being a business owner of Sangon & Co? Um, Annie does have a background in business. Uh, she started selling her handmade jewellery outside her mom's office at a very young age. I think when she was like 10 or 11, <laughs> she had zero customers except her mom's friend. So... Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, but in all seriousness, um, no, not really. But <laughs> yeah, she says she says good times. But uh, other than that, um, I've personally done charity, charitable work. So um, that's how I've gotten to like you know know how to stay organized and sort things out. Yeah. So that's our business background. Business background. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of young people can uh, relate to this, you know, not have not particularly studying business in school or anything. So mm-hmm. from you, you come from a more creative uh, education background. Um, yeah. Was it, was it particularly difficult when you were running the business, you know, like in terms of managing finances, just things that are beyond your creative expertise? Yeah. And how do you kind oh, of... Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're still currently struggling with... Um, finance like more and more to the account side like trying to keep track and I would say because um for me being in the creative background you always want more you know I can do this I can do that but when you own a business there's always like a budget that you have to stay on to even though we're like the sole owners of it and like we can basically do whatever we want but at the same time, you don't want to rugi, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Annie keeps me in check. She definitely does. Like, we we have like a certain amount that okay, this month we're running on this and we stock. But um, other than that, um, also I would say for Annie would be the socializing part behind a screen. That that for me as well. I would say um, in person, I would know what to say because in person, you would, um, you could somewhat tell by a person's um, tone or their body language. And so constantly being on your phone as a online business online, it's, it's pretty hard to get the message across sometimes. And so that would be one of the struggles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So um, I think you kind of touched on uh, the next question a little bit already, um, but are there any kind of specific challenges that your business face uh, due, like because of the pandemic? Um, and how do you guys kind of maneuver around that? I would say competition. That, mm. that would be one thing because, yeah, I mean, we can't expect everyone to be at home and not, you know, doing anything also. So as much as competition is there, we try to uh, look at it as like community over competition because no matter what, like everyone, everyone has their struggles. And so uh, we just try our best to, if, if any of them even have questions, we would, you know, tell them and hopefully together we'll go together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that's a very nice way of uh, seeing it, like having uh, a community instead of a uh, business competition. Yeah. Yeah so, um, yeah, so kind of let's talk a little bit about um, the future of Sangon & Co and what plans mm -hmm. you guys have for a business. So uh, we all know that the pandemic um, is not really going to go away um, anytime soon, soon. Uh, so with all the uncertainty caused by the pandemic still present, how are you planning to help your business to recover or to grow? Um, as the owners, I would say, um, how do we grow would be, so, like to be healthy, I would say, like not just physically, but like mentally. I mean, I, yeah, like everyone is struggling, but at the end of the day, like work is work. Somehow you just have to put it aside no matter how hard it is. And uh, yeah, and also um, not just for yourself, but also the people around that you, you work with and the people you want to work with. Because like, um, like currently like you and I right now, like if my energy was super low, like this whole conversation wouldn't be good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And also to have meetings online and, and all that, it's it's a drag because um, when you're staying home so much, you have that urge to want to go out, go to your studio, go to your office. But like, yeah, to keep an open mind and also just eat healthy, stay healthy and like have enough sleep, I would say that would be one of our ways to like grow. But mm -hmm. um, in general is to, because we have an open mind and like, you know, like we're awake, it helps us to keep ideas coming. Yeah, um, not just create, create creativity wise, but um, also ways on, yeah, like sorting out our accounts. Like, <laughs> like um, yeah, like basically how to just go through it and like force yourself to like, okay, this is what I have to do. But um, other than that, also basically build up our social media platforms that we have currently. Mm -hmm. um, just because you have it doesn't mean that that's enough, you know? You should always try your best to, like, strive for, like, a better result every day, day by day. So, yeah, a lot of self-motivation. Mm. All right, so you talk a little bit about uh, social media, and if anyone that sees your uh, Sangon & Co's uh, social media you know that, um, can tell that you guys put in a lot of effort in it. Um, so... Do you have like a particular like strategy as to how are you guys planning to use social media to kind of grow your business and to grow your customer base? Um, strategy. Uh, I would say follow the trends, but like at the same time, not because it's a very, I would say that's a very taboo. I mean, social media is a, it, it changes constantly. So if you stay in the trend too much, you might lose a sense of your own um, identity, I would mm. say. But like, it's also good that you stay on it because you're not left behind. And so like, for example, like um, Instagram features, now you have Reels, you know, back then it was TikTok. And now they're saying that Reels um, algorithm is better, and, you know, all these yada, yada, yada. It's so hard to keep up, but you just have to. And even currently, like Sangon and Ko only has um, two reels up and uh like I know that that's not enough but it's so hard to get up and um motivate yourself to like okay today I want to shoot this I mean you can but like it's a bit draining so I would say yeah with social media and everything that's one thing that you have to look out for um yeah just keep up with the trend but also know who you are 
And with our website, we would also um, want to reflect who we are and what we do. So Sangon and Ko not only, yeah, I forgot to touch on this. <laughs> Sangon and Ko <laughs> not only um, does jewelry, uh, basically the idea of it was to eventually expand to something bigger than just jewelry. So uh, we wanted to like uh, cater to everyone, like even moms with hobbies for like plants or like small little home decor around your house. So that's actually what we have now. So we have a collection called Rare Gems for um, local artisanal home decor and also um, one collection specifically for charity. So we're currently working right now with a um, organization for animals for wildlife called Project Borneo. And so basically after we've built our platform, we want to give it back to our community. And so that's currently what we're doing with our social media, not only just to market us, but also what we have to offer here in Kuching and in Borneo in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of exciting things going on. It's with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, now let's just move on to the next question that we have for you. Um, mm -hmm. So now think back through your whole like entrepreneurship journey. Um, what is your business's uh, proudest achievement to date? Our proudest achievement would be, yeah, like being able to reach out to people, especially the um, charitable organization. So when we first started, our first um, first organization that we reached out to was the um, dyslexic, and, oh no, sorry, the Autistic Association in Kuching. And then we did one as well for dyslexic uh, kids. And then most recently, I think um, two months ago, was at a all girls orphanage. So I would say that would, yeah, that was one of our biggest achievements, especially the most recent one, because um, it, it was actually in the planning since last December. We were supposed to go with Chantel, yeah, uh, the founder of Bauer House and Sharni and Chantel. But uh, due to the pandemic and everything, we couldn't. And so months later, around like February, we finally got to be able to, to head um, all the way there to the center and meet 15 girls there and like just chill. <laughs> yeah, and make jewelry. So I would say that was one of our proudest moments. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, can, can tell that your business focused a lot a lot of it uh, is on kind of thinking about how to utilize your platform um, yeah. for society as well, um, which is really nice. Uh, it's Thank nice that you. <laughs> um, yeah, so can you, so now let's move on to the next question. So um, can you name one entrepreneur whom you admire and explain uh, why and how they have inspired you in your entrepreneurship journey? Oh, Chantal. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So, um, <laughs> yeah, I would say that was also one of our biggest achievements, actually, to be, um, yeah, to be recognized by her. So um, why? Because, I don't know, her, her work ethic is just, yeah, it's so motivating to see how she works and how she gives back. So she also started, like, a um, charitable organization of her own called Kuching Food Aid. Um, and she's actually been doing it um, around Australia as well, basically just helping people in need. Lah. But um, basically, even when I was younger, my mom, I remember my mom bought this um, Serenity and Chantel headband. Yeah, their, their, base, their brand is very uh, extra. And as a kid, I just didn't like it. Like, to be very honest, to be very honest, it was not my style. <laughs> so, <laughs> but like, um, they always had this brochure, this book, of like how to style it and like the story behind each piece and the founders and everything. And also, um, if I'm not mistaken, she's also a graphic designer. She designs like her own stuff. And so going out, being a graphic designer and realizing that like, huh, I didn't like it back then, but now I respect her as an artist and a business owner. Then she must be doing something right. <laughs> so yeah, so like, um, during my university days, I would say my inspiration would be her. Yeah. Right. <laughs> your, your mom must be like 
You see, I told you a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and she's watching. She's like, mm, "I did. I made the right choice." Yeah. <laughs> right. That, that's really that's really nice. Um, yeah. So we we have arrived at the last question actually. Um, mm-hmm. So we just want to ask you: um, Do you think young people? especially young people who are watching our Talkie Talks today, um, mm. do you think they should start their own business and why? Huh, that's a... That's a <laughs> I would say yes and no. Yes, because... Um, okay, no. Let me start on no first. <laughs> no, because you're not a student every day. and You don't get to be a student like the next year. So once you're done with that phase... You're never going to get it back. And I would say be in the moment, but also be aware of what's happening around you. And growing up in that um, phase is very important because once you get in uni and after uni, it's work. You know, that, that's, that's the idea, the whole idea of being Asian. Right? That's the idea. Right? After university, you straight away work. But so, so yes, you should start a business, but start it because you love it start it because you know who you are and you know what you want to do next not because um you should just start it because you want to earn money yeah i mean earning earning money is also a thing like it's it's important to know how and why but don't get too trapped into being very money faced because once you grow old yeah oh this is becoming very sentimental but <laughs> But yeah, basically yes and no. You you figure it out loud. I, I cannot tell you, uh, I cannot tell you guys the exact answer because we are our own person. But basically, on whatever journey you're on, just um try and figure out why you do these things and reflect it onto your business. Yeah. Yeah. So the key really here is to be reflective and know your intentions behind like whether you want to start a business or not start a business, right? So yeah, thanks. that was that was a simpler way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think your advice is very relevant for a lot of young people. Um, so yeah, I think that would be very useful for our audience here. All right, so um, that's all questions that I have for you actually. So now we can oh, okay. move on to the Q and A session, uh, which is when uh, I will ask you some of the questions that the audience um, have posted. Um, so the first one is, um, you mentioned about 18K plated. What's the difference between 14K and 18K? Is 18K better for metal allergy? Gold plated in general, um, because Annie herself has a uh, very, like she's allergic prone, she has allergic prone skin. Yeah, and it runs in her family. So I would say gold plated in general, um, it really depends. It's it's not. I would say it's actually not hypoallergenic because you you still get sensitive by it. So basically, what gold plated is is um a normal metal like brass or copper is being um dipped or coated with um gold. That's why it's called gold plated. So no matter what the metal like beneath it is still it's still gonna make you itch. Yeah. So I would say. Um, gold plated do ask your the store or the owners or whoever you're buying it from what the base metal is if it's stainless steel gold plated then it should be fine because we use that as well and Annie's ears or her skin is fine with it so um, yeah uh, for that's sorry very <laughs> for buying <laughs> yeah I'm oh, so sorry I cut you off no but, no uh, right. 14k is basically a thinner um, coat 18k is higher so basically it it um gold plated does not rust but eventually they do tarnish not because of the metal itself but due to um oxidation so even if you even if your jewelry doesn't touch water basically leaving it out in the open will still oxidize it and that's why the metal tarnishes because it's so thin it's yeah it bas- it basically evaporates yeah right <laughs> full on lesson for everyone. Useful <laughs> <Yes. laughs> information. Um, right. So the second question is, how do you guys source for your materials? Ah, this was very hard. 
um, how do we source them uh, online? We did a lot of research before we started it, and I was very, um, I was very privileged enough to meet someone like Annie who has like a drive the same as I do and so before we actually met up we've already done like um, research on okay who this seller is are they trustable and um, nowadays a lot of things are fake lah. so I would say we had to spend a lot of money for, for us lah. personally it was a lot of money for us as students but like we had to spend quite an amount to really really, really know what works for us but yeah, online is your best friend. Everything's online now. Even <laughs> you guys watching us right now is also online. <laughs> so basically, it's good to ask around um, other businesses how they source them, but also be mindful that they also put in the work. And if they could do it, if then you can as well. And so that's what we did. We weren't dependent on how people went on their journey. We just decided that we want to go through it ourselves. Yeah. All right. So um, the next question is, um, I'm just wondering, how is the product making process like? Like, do, how do you get your idea for a jewelry and make it real? The, uh, there's a lot of questions you wanna. <laughs> the yeah. product making process. Yeah. Um, it's a lot to do with playing around. Basically, if you've played Tetris. Like the very 2000s game, it's basically, it's basically the same. So <laughs> once we have the materials, Annie does this thing where she'll just like swap and take another one and just swap. If it doesn't work, then she'll swap it again. I mean, that's personally how we work. I don't know about other people. But um, being, uh, I would say my strongest strength as a graphic designer would be colors. And so I took that as my advantage and do what I can. But also, your second question, um, the idea of making the jewelry, right? Mm -hmm. um, basically, just stick to your gut. Sell something that you yourself like, because if you don't, then you can't convince your audience to buy it. Yeah, so as I said um, before, um, stay true to yourself and really know who you are as a person to reflect that on your business. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and the next question that someone has is, um, where do you get inspiration to make the beautiful jewelry? My grandmamas. <laughs> Our grandmamas. So uh, my grandma, my grandma from my dad's side, because um, I mix and use full Chinese. So uh, my dad's side, she... I think she's, she's a family from like a Nonya family. And so like Nonya's being very fancy and all. They like to wear like all these pearls. And when I started Sangon, my grandma actually gave me her own, her very own like set of um, pearl necklaces. And so, yeah, she would tell me about what kind she would wear. I'll go on Google and like search like 70s uh, women's fashion. And I'll show her, mama like took her like this one. Is it you wear like this? And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, just take inspiration from that. Then uh, my grandma from my mom's side, she was also quite a diva. I would, say, I, I would say my mom was also quite diva. Right? So the, the inspiration came from my family. Um, for Annie, I would say she's more on the minimal side. I can still go a tad bit extra. <laughs> so I would say for her, um, it has to do a lot with like comfortability and what she herself would wear. Because she herself has like all these um, skin allergy. And so being um, to have pieces that work for your everyday life is very suitable for her lifestyle. Yeah. Nice. So it's like two different kind of different styles like coming together. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And the next question from the audience is, how do you balance between highlighting the indigenous styles and meanings behind your brand and your brand being too seen as too kitschy or traditional looking? Oh, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, it's something that we battle with almost every single time we come out with a design. Um, yeah, so what we've been doing is that we've been um, correlating our pieces, like our materials, and 
trying to think of like stories that reflect them and yeah so basically back then we had this piece called um, a Tucson necklace it was actually one of our favorites but uh is when we're, we're no longer making those anymore due to like um, material sourcing but basically they were like square shaped and pearls and they were like kind of edgy and what struck us was that it reminded us so much of the Tucson cliff in Miri yeah so basically in Miri there's this cliff that um not broken what's the word uh it like yeah basically it's no longer there like it came crumbling down and so now if you go to Miri it's not there anymore and so we just wanted a piece to remind people that it was there so I would say um now we're naming pieces after these uh folk folklores and everything but um other than that if it's too indigenous style like if the style is too like indigenous if people say it's not that nice, then, well, that's your problem. You know, I'm freaking indigenous. And so what's the problem? <laughs> you know what I mean? If you don't like it, don't buy it. Or if you can find it from other stores, go ahead. There's Shopee. I'm pretty sure Shopee got other indigenous stuff. So honestly, that would be my response out because at the end of the day, it's my business. And yeah. Right. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so for the next question would be um, how do you decide your pricing based on your sourcing of precious stones and pearls um, basically our pricing is based on yeah like the cost price of the materials themselves but because I would say some pearls like those chunky really organic looking ones are very hard to source in you know Malaysia yeah so we would source them all the way from like even mexico actually or like other yeah in, in the us even so how we source them is actually etsy etsy actually helps you a lot so if any of you yeah just go on etsy man <laughs> but um yeah so on the cost price and then basically we add up our cost price and see how much it is and also how much time we took to make each piece i would say that would be the most important because it's your effort and not just the effort of you making it, but also the effort of like thinking and yeah, basically sorting out like how it would look or if it would sell. And beyond all of that, it has a lot to do with um, uh, getting over your insecurities. Back to the question before, like, you know, what if people think it's too indigenous or, you know, whatever. Like you really have to put aside like that fear, like why if people don't like it, huh? Like will it sell? You just have to like grow out of it and just put it aside, like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and so that's how we price them, basically. Um, not just how we think of it, but at the end of the day, like how we want other people to feel about it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So those are all the questions that we have from the audience. Um, yeah, so um, thank you so much, everyone, for submitting your questions. So everyone that was Mars from Sangun and Co, um, I think what I really took away from this session is that um, for, for Mars and Annie, they both really um, value, you know, being yourself and also liking the products that you create so that you can convince other people to like them as well and you know at some point you just have to kind of draw the line between I'm selling you know um, creative pieces that like I really like and I'm passionate about and maybe you know to some extent I shouldn't really care about um, care so much about oh will people not like it or people like it but um, and that really embodies the brand right to really be, yeah. able to be raw um, yes yeah, and I, I really like that. <laughs> and I hope the audience really take away something um, from today's session as well. Um, so if you're interested to check out more about Sangwon and Co and um, the products that they, they are currently uh, selling, do check out their social media and uh, their website. Um, as Mars Express, um, please go check out their Insta feed. <laughs> it's really aesthetic. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> um, yeah, do, do go check it out. Um, it's it's a really it's a it's a really nice business and the, the product. That Thank you out. so much, guys. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> yeah, go go check them out if, if you're interested in getting jewelry for yourself or your friends. Um, right. So um, next Stalky Talks that's happening next Wednesday is um, 
Jen Le from uh, Season Studio. Uh, so it's also a night session, so it will be 8 p.m. So you can sign up via the you can sign up via the Bitly link, bit.ly slash Taupe Season Studio. All right. So uh, the next slide, please. Right, so we are currently having we're, we're currently having um, Rise Online. So Rise Online is our flagship program. Um, if you're interested to learn more about starting a business after today's Talkie Talk, you can head on uh, to bit.ly slash Rise Online 2021. Um, it's a free beginners online course for Malaysians to, uh, to learn at their own pace about the basics of building a small business from scratch. And this course closes on the 20, 30th of July, 2021. So you still have a bit of time to jump onto the course and do it at your own pace. Um, and Malay if you're a Malaysian aged from 18 to 28 years old, uh, you'll also get a chance to win uh, seed funding up to 10,000 ringgit to start your business. You can start today by signing up at the business. Right? So um, if you're interested to check out more about RISE programs, uh, feel free to uh, go to our uh, Talkie Talks uh, social media on Facebook, on Instagram, and also uh, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, that's where you can find out all of the recordings of our past Talkie Talks and also our upcoming Talkie Talks as well. All right. So thank you everyone for coming and so <laughs> we'll see you um, next week for the next Talkie Talk session. And thank you so much, Mara. Thank you. Here. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> see ya. Bye. Bye.